Well, this morning we are basically going to be looking at four verses from Luke's gospel. And <clears throat> as I've said before, the Lord often has a way. I mean, He's always working uh, according to His will. And it does appear as, you know, just thinking about how to address the situation that we're faced with today, uh, there's many places in Scripture that we could go to to do that. We've already looked at a couple. But what I'd like to do is look at it from our text this morning because this text actually gives to us the opportunity to do exactly that because it is addressing this very issue and how we should respond to it. Uh, let me go ahead and read the text in Luke 19, verses 41 through 44, and then we'll take a look at what it says. Luke writes, when he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side and they will level you to the ground and your children within you and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Now again, the theme we're looking at this morning is where there is greater privilege, there is greater responsibility. And I think you can see already the application of that. But let me begin by just reminding us where we were last week to keep it fresh in our minds and, and to see what, what, we're, what Jesus is doing right here and how this transition takes place from the triumphal entry as He's moving towards Jerusalem. Well, last week we saw, as I mentioned before, one of those very special events in God's plan of redemption. And that was Jesus presenting Himself as Israel's King. And this was special because this was the fulfillment of God's promise to David. And he would raise up one of his children, set him on his throne, and establish his kingdom forever. We need to understand that this is what Israel had hoped for from the time that God had basically said these words to David. And now many hundreds of years later, this hope was finally being realized. So this is a special event. It is a wondrous event. It is, it is basically God's moving His plan of redemption forward. But now we also saw there were two different reactions to this event. The disciples were all celebrating, praising God for His faithfulness and blessing the King that He had sent. Now they were doing this because they thought that God had sent the Messiah into the world to save them from the Romans. They were celebrating this as a political victory, and yet that's not what it really was at all. How much more would they have celebrated this event if they had known why Jesus really came, which was to save them from eternal suffering? Now, again, how much more should we celebrate knowing that that is exactly the reason why Jesus came and knowing that He's accomplished that work and He has done that for us? That's what we're to be doing as we gather together for worship. That's what we're to be doing on the Lord's day, celebrating the completed work of our Lord Jesus Christ for us. We are safe because of what He has done. Now, the Pharisees, on the other hand, were urging Jesus to silence His disciples. This celebrating really threatened them. If the Romans found out about this king, they would come and take away their position. Now, tying this into what we've seen recently in God's Word, uh, we see they were concerned about what they had of this world. They didn't want to lose what Jesus said we must be willing to give up if we are to follow Him. So they're holding on to the world when Jesus says, you've got to let go of these things if you're going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. So the disciples were celebrating. The Pharisees were trying to hush all this down. And the question is, why the two different responses? Well, the answer is, it's because they were both in two different kingdoms. Even though they were a part of what we would call the typological kingdom, that is the Pharisees, the, the picture of God's eternal kingdom, they weren't a part of His real kingdom, the spiritual kingdom. 
They were a part of the devil's kingdom, while the disciples were a part of God's kingdom. The citizens of both kingdoms have two different kinds of natures. Those in God's kingdom can see His glory, and that's why they celebrate it, while those in the devil's kingdom are blind to that glory. The Holy Spirit is really the one who makes all the difference. When He opens our eyes, we want to celebrate what He does. And again, that's why we're celebrating this morning. We may not all be together here to celebrate, but we are gathered in His name by His Holy Spirit, called by His Spirit and Word to celebrate Christ. Now, finally, we saw Jesus' response to the Pharisees' insistence that the disciples quiet down. He said in verse 40, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. When the Father sent the Son into the world, remember, He also sent His angels to celebrate that event because of how great, how special it was. Now that He was sending His Son to Jerusalem to complete His mission by laying down His life, He would make sure that event was celebrated as well. If it's not going to be by the disciples, it would be from the creation itself. Even the rocks would cry out because Jesus is worthy to be praised. Let's not forget to give Him glory and honor and worship today. But now we see an interesting change in tone, don't we, as Jesus approaches the city. It's not in the disciples, but it's in Jesus Himself. While they continued to celebrate, Jesus began to weep. Now this morning, we're going to consider why that took place, and I've already told you why, and that's because the main point of this, this whole sermon Where there is greater privilege, there will be greater responsibility. And of course, we know the Jews sinned against great light, and so great judgment was coming upon them. Now, first of all, we see that Jesus wept. It really shouldn't surprise us to see this kind of affection in our Lord Jesus. We know Jesus had a very tender heart. You know, we noted last week that it wasn't but a few days earlier that he was at the tomb of Lazarus weeping. He was weeping because of the pain that Lazarus' death had caused his dear friends, Martha and Mary and the Jews who were surrounding him. We read in John 11, verses 32 through 36. When Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him and fell at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled and said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews were saying, see how he loved him. You'll notice there isn't any parenthetical comment written, you know, written here by John. Jesus wasn't really weeping about, you know, the, uh, the, the, just the emotions that were going on in the people around him. Uh, he was really weeping about their unbelief. That's really not what we see here. But he was weeping because they were weeping, because they were grieved. Jesus had a very sensitive heart. He had, a very, he had very, uh, strong affections. And when he sent the 70 out both to preach and to do miracles, they came back celebrating the fact that even the demons had to obey them. And when he heard this, Jesus was filled with joy because of how his Father was working through them. We read in Luke 10, verses 20 and 21, Jesus said to them, Do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. At that very time, he rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit and said, I praise you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this was well-pleasing in your sight. Now, the point behind this is Jesus had a sensitive heart, Jesus had very strong affections. 
And you know, Jesus wanted those strong affections also to be present in the hearts of his disciples. He actually warned them that when 70 AD came and there was going to be a great um, increase in the, the sin and the wickedness around them, he warned them not to let that sin cause their hearts to become hard. He says in Matthew 24, verse 12, because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. Now, this is something we also need to guard our own hearts against in a day like this when there is such open disregard for God's law. You know, especially as we see all the panic that is ongoing because of the coronavirus, we see people becoming very selfish. We see them hoarding, and some people hoard because they have to, because there's a large group of people that are out there just trying to get everything for themselves so their families will be taken care of, and it creates a sort of environment where others have to go out and do the same thing. Otherwise, there's not going to be anything for their family. We need to guard ourselves against this kind of thinking that, you know, we think only of ourselves and not of others. When we see them doing things that are selfish, we must not let those things provoke us to do selfish things. Now, we do need to do what we need to, to take care of ourselves, but let's not go overboard and deny other people the things that they need. Now, the other thing, too, is that we see this kind of hardening going on, not only among unbelievers, but we see it happening also among believers. The only way that we can guard ourselves against this is not in our own strength. We need the help of God's Holy Spirit. He's the one who softens our heart to begin with. And unless we are filled constantly with the Spirit of God, we won't have the defense that we need. We need Him that our hearts might remain sensitive. He is the one who creates these strong affections that we need so that we can remain sensitive again to the need of those around us. Now, how do we get filled with the Holy Spirit? Let me just summarize this quickly. We get that through worship. We have to worship the Lord, not just for this hour and a half, but with our whole lives, reading His Word, praying, walking with Him, obeying His Word, fellowshipping. That's how we worship Him on a continual basis. Paul tells us that our whole lives need to be a continual act of worship. And that is the only way to keep our affections strong. That's the only way we're going to remain like Jesus. Okay, so the first thing is we see Jesus wept. Now, the second question is, why did Jesus weep? Well, it was first of all because He knew it was going to happen uh, with regard to the Jewish people not very long from then. They were rejoicing now, but within a week... They were going to reject Him, and in rejecting Him, they were going to reject the only way they could have peace with God. He says in verse 42, if you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace. The Jews were at war with God as the rest of mankind. Jesus came to preach peace through the gospel, and that was the only way that they could possibly receive it. You know, the Bible says there's only one way that we can have peace with God, only one way for our warfare to end, that warfare that we have with God even coming into the world because we come into the world already averse to Him, already at war with Him, already unwilling to obey Him. The only way the warfare can end is by trusting in the Lord Jesus. Paul tells us in just one verse what this means in Romans 5 verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Unless we trust in Him and our sins are forgiven and His righteousness is given to us and we are declared just by God, we are still at war with Him. Now, the Jews, for the most part, believed that they could have this peace through their works. If they could only be good enough God would accept them. Sometimes we might think the same thing. You know, sometimes we fall into that same trap, even though we believe. 
that our acceptance with God comes purely through faith in Jesus Christ. If we can only overcome this one sin that we're constantly struggling with, if we can only do this one thing that we haven't been able to do that we know God wants us to do, God will accept us if we can do those things. Well, the Bible says that we can never be good enough for God to accept us. The only way we can have peace with God is through His Son, the Lord Jesus. We must receive Him. Justification, being accepted by God, is by grace through faith alone. And the Bible says it doesn't matter what we have done in our lives, in our past, if we will trust Him, all of our sins will be forgiven and He will accept us. But He only accepts us through Jesus. So first of all, Jesus wept because He had come to bring peace and He knew that they were going to reject it. Secondly, Jesus wept because their rejection meant that God was hardening them judicially by rejecting him. And remember, this is the culmination of three and a half years of ministry. This isn't the first time they saw Jesus. This isn't the first time they heard Jesus. But Jesus knew that the celebration was going to come to an end and they were soon going to reject him and call out for his blood. But this rejection meant judicial hardening. By rejecting Jesus, they were rejecting his father. And so the father was going to reject them. As a matter of fact, he was already doing that. He was hardening them. Again, listen to what Jesus says in verse 42. Again, speaking of Jerusalem, and this is the cause of his weeping, of his grief. If you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. Hidden in, in two, for, from two different causes, hidden because of their sin, but hidden because of God's justice. The Bible tells us that when people refuse to listen to what God tells them, to the truth He gives them, then He often withholds His truth from them by which they could be saved. Uh, when the disciples asked Jesus on one occasion why He was speaking to the crowds in parables, he did not say that it was to make the lesson more concrete so it might be more easily understood. That's what a lot of Christians today believe Jesus used parables for, to communicate truth. Well, it was to communicate truth, but only to a certain audience, not to everyone. It was meant to hide the truth because there were those who were there that did not deserve to know it. Listen to what Jesus says to His disciples in Matthew 13, verses 11 through 13. To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. For whoever has, to him more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has, shall be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because while seeing... They do not see, and while hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. Jesus couldn't say it any more plainly. If, if He has revealed His truth, then He's going to give you an abundance of truth, and you will know all of His truth because you want to know it. But to those who have resisted His truth, He just withdraws that truth from them, and even when He's speaking to teach, he doesn't allow them to understand. You know, it may not be long before the Lord takes His truth entirely away from those nations that have had His truth for so long, but continue to reject and resist it. Let's also not forget that even while the Lord gives His truth, as we've seen uh, in, in the passage that I just read, that the Lord can still declare His truth and hide it at the same time. God may choose to not give, actually, the lamp that is necessary for us to understand that truth, which is the light of His Holy Spirit, whom He sovereignly gives to whom He pleases. So even in the midst of truth, God still has to give the lamp of the Holy Spirit. Now, we have that lamp, 
if we're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, we see the value of His Word, we will receive it, we will embrace it, we will have an abundance. But if we don't have that lamp, we may have the Word. We may actually become experts in what it says, but we will not really possess the true treasure of the Word of God because we will not listen to what it says and do what it says. We need to make sure that we're doing what we know. Now, finally, the third reason why Jesus wept was because he knew that this hardening, this veiling of their minds was just the beginning of God's judgment. When God takes away the light and people then walk in greater darkness, they bring on themselves an even greater judgment. Listen to what Jesus says in the conclusion of our passage. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side and they will level you to the ground and your children within you and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. You know, I, I can't say this the way that Jesus would have said it. He said it while he was weeping because this was breaking his heart. These were his people, even though they hated him and were rejecting him, these were his people and the fact that God's judgment would fall on them rather than his blessing was a source of grief to him. Now, what is Jesus talking about here? Well, the enemies he was referring to, of course, were the Romans in 70 AD. They were, they were going to march against, against Jerusalem. They would come during the Feast of Passover when the Romans knew they would be at their most vulnerable. When you're celebrating a feast, you're not ready for war. They would surround Jerusalem and lay siege to it, okay, which means that they would trap more Jews than normal inside that city because the city was full of Jews from all over the Roman Empire. This was one of the three annual feasts that every male Jew over the age of 13 was required to attend, one of three feasts, which means there were a lot of Jews in Jerusalem at that time. And that siege would last for five months, five months without anything coming in or going out of the city, no supplies, no provision. Uh, actually, if we had time to explore this particular theme, we'd see the city was also in turmoil because there were people hoarding, as you might imagine. There were three factions, a civil war was going on inside, and all three of those in power were hoarding the supplies to themselves, and many of the people were starving. There was terrible disease. Even during those five months, Jesus would say that nothing like this has ever come upon a people before, nor would it ever again. Even what happened during the Holocaust was nothing compared to what went on in Jerusalem during this time. And it would end with the Romans breaking through the walls of Jerusalem, tearing down the temple, not one stone would be left upon another, and killing many of the Jews that actually survived those five months of seclusion and of having laid, been laid siege to. Now, the reason this judgment would be so severe, Jesus said, was that they did not recognize the time of their visitation. When the Father was visiting them in His mercy, remember we talked about just his sending Jesus into the world was a special event that was celebrated. His being there for three and a half years, preaching and healing, declaring the kingdom of heaven, that was a great blessing. And now he's coming to present himself as king. The Father is visiting them in his mercy to fulfill all of his promises through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet they did not recognize that and they did not receive him where there is greater privilege. And up until that time, there was no one more privileged than the Jews. There is greater responsibility. That is responsibility for living up to that privilege. Jesus says in Luke 12, 48, which is our memory verse uh, for this week, from everyone who has been given much, much will be required. And to whom they entrusted much, of him, they will ask all the more. Greater privilege means greater responsibility. Now, in concluding this, I want us to consider what this means today 
for individuals and for nations that reject God's truth. Well, the point of this passage is that the Lord is going to hold everyone accountable according to the light that he has given to each person or to each nation. Now, in Reform circles, we like to talk about the privileges that uh, our children have being raised in a Christian household with the gospel um, when there are many children that are being raised in absolute darkness and absolute ignorance. They're being raised in the ways of the world. They know nothing about God's truth. And the privilege our children have being raised by parents who continually pray for them. You know, these are things perhaps we don't appreciate early on, but we do appreciate later, especially if we come to the Lord. What a great blessing it is not to have been raised in darkness, but to have been raised in the light. Now, the thing that isn't emphasized as much is what this means for those children who don't embrace that light, but who turn from the truth to the world. Okay, and you can see the parallel, I think, between this and the situation that the Jews are in. The Jews were raised with God's truth, but they rejected it. What's going to happen to them? Well, the same thing that happens to those who have the gospel, who are raised with the gospel, but don't embrace the gospel. Greater privilege means greater responsibility. If they do not turn away from the world to Jesus, even though they may have been raised this way, even though they may have been raised in the church, it's going to go much harder for them in the end. Jesus tells us again in Luke 12, verse 47, that slave, the one who was in the Lord's household, the one who knew His will and did not get ready or act in accord with His will, will receive many lashes. And by the way, that doesn't mean that the Lord's going to flog His people, but what it means is this person doesn't know the Lord, and in the end, he's going to receive or she's going to receive a greater judgment. Now, many of these children that don't receive the Lord immediately and go out into the world, many of them do turn and come back to the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's certainly what we need to be praying for, for our youth, for our children. But what happens if they don't, if they don't, Knowing all those things will actually work against them in the end. The same thing is true of adults who have uh, maybe not been raised with these privileges. Maybe they have. But they profess to know the Lord Jesus Christ. They join the church. They take the vows of membership. And by the way, those vows of membership are really the definition of what it means to be a Christian. You really can't not keep any of those or not believe any of those things and be a Christian, okay? Uh, they take these vows, they make these affirmations, but then they end up not keeping those vows. They end up leaving the church. Well, what happens to them? Well, in the same thing that happens with the children, first of all, the Lord in His faithfulness will seek to reclaim them. But if they persist in resisting Him, the Bible says He will eventually let them go. He will let them go because they never actually, in fact, knew Him to begin with. That's the reason why people come into the church and go out of the church. It's not because they, they're saved and they lose their salvation. It's because they were never saved to begin with. Listen to what John writes in 1 John 2, 19. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they all are not of us. I mean, people leaving the church is not something new to our age. John is addressing a church that was affected by Gnosticism or something proto-Gnostic in those days, the belief, again, that the material is evil, that Jesus couldn't have become a man. And that's why he emphasizes in that letter that we must confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, otherwise... We don't have the Spirit of God, okay? Well, people were leaving, being seduced by false beliefs, and they were leaving the church, being seduced by the world. They were leaving the church. But why were they leaving the church? It's because they didn't love the Lord, and they didn't want to keep the, the well, basically the commitments they had made to Him. They go out because they really do not belong to the Lord. Well, you know, what's true of individuals is also true of nations, where there is greater privilege, such as the Western world has enjoyed for so many centuries, there is greater responsibility. 
You know, there was a time in the United States during the time of the colonies. Uh, because they were originally colonized by people who were primarily God-fearing, Bible-believing Christians, that these colonies were founded on godly principles. I mean, not absolutely, but many of them were. Some of the colonies were actually governed by God's laws, which we would argue is the best possible law to be governed by. But consider what things were like at the beginning and what things are like now. We have fallen so far from where we were. Today, many of our leaders and many of our people call good what the Lord calls evil. And they not only, again, um, they not only commit those things, and they not only encourage other people to do those things, but they've gone even beyond what Paul says they do in Romans. They actually try to force this new morality on everyone else under the penalty of persecution. That's why we need to be thankful that the Lord has given us a bit of a reprieve at the present time because of our current leadership. Things were getting very, very difficult. Now, it's not that everybody on that particular side, as far as uh, those that have been persecuting us, uh, that everything they want is wrong, but a lot of it is. And because of that, God is going to hold us accountable. If we have asked the question, which I'm sure most of us have, uh, why are we going through what we're going through now? Why does this coronavirus exist? Why has the Lord allowed these things to take place? We do need to remember that these things have taken place because God has allowed it. God didn't create the coronavirus, but He knew it was going to come into existence. He knew it was going to spread, but He didn't prevent it. That's what sovereignty means. The question we're asking is, why did God allow this to take place? Well, He did for at least three reasons. First of all, he wants us to trust Him, right? Whenever difficulties come, we will not be afraid because we'll trust in the Lord. David writes this in Psalm 32, verse 10, and this perhaps is a verse that we would all do well to memorize. He who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness shall surround him. Now, David wrote that at a time when he was surrounded by enemies because of various things he was going through in his life. But he comes to the realization, if I'll just trust in the Lord and do His will, He will take care of me. God wants us to trust Him, and that's one of the reasons why He brought the coronavirus. I think it's time for us as Christians to kind of reset our priorities, as I was saying earlier in our prayers. You know, what are we doing with our lives? Are we living the way the Lord calls us to live? This is a wake-up call to begin to do that. Well, secondly, he brought this to judge the wicked, as I've already mentioned. This is the penalty of their sin. God tells us in Romans chapter 1 that he is pouring out his wrath on a daily basis, continually pouring out his wrath on those who know he exists, but they worship and serve the, cre the creation rather than the creator. So this is judgment upon the wicked, but let's not forget the third purpose which is to lead his lost sheep to his son, that they might be saved. Fear of death, fear of judgment, this is one of the strongest motivators to get people to listen to the gospel and to turn to him. So this is coming in order for a, an opportunity for the church to bear witness to the gospel. So we need to look for those opportunities and be open to them. Now, the question I, I tried to address at the beginning through some of the readings was the answer to this last question, why is this virus also affecting third world nations that really have not enjoyed the privileges that we enjoy? And you, you know the answer to that question. It's because even though they may not have the Bible, they do have nature. They have the book of nature, the light of nature. We read earlier in Romans 1. Everyone sees, everybody knows that God exists, that He is. Through the creation and that revelation actually gets through. Everybody understands it. But, as Paul said, they also reject it. So in a certain sense, they're like the servants in Luke chapter 12 who didn't know the Master's will. 
but committed deeds worthy of a flogging. Now, they're not excused. He says they will receive fewer stripes, but those stripes can still be severe. And actually, uh, we can apply this principle, I believe, to the things that are happening now, but we need to realize Jesus was actually applying that principle to what happens after this life. He's talking about what happens in hell. The one who knew the master's will and didn't get ready receives many stripes. The one who didn't know his master's will but committed deeds worthy of a flogging will receive few, but all of it will be intolerable. So they're still culpable. Even though they don't know the special revelation of God, they still have truth that they reject, and that's why judgment also comes upon them. That's what we read about in Romans chapter 1. Now, in closing, there is one final question that we need to ask ourselves, and that is, what should our attitude be toward those affected by this judgment? Okay, well, it should be the same as our Lord's, as our Lord Jesus. Because remember His attitude when He rode into the city, thinking about what was going to happen to, uh, to Jerusalem and to the people of His people, the people of God. He didn't rejoice over the coming destruction of His people. Jesus wept. Jesus wept because He was moved for them. He cared about them. Let's not forget about the Apostle Paul, what he had to say about his relationship with the Jews, even while they were trying to kill him and had put him through many miserable things, right? He said, I would rather be accursed for the sake of my people, you know, that I would rather be cast away and condemned to hell in order that they might be saved. And he said that for his enemies. When Jesus was on the cross, what was his attitude? Lord, send fire and brimstone to destroy them like James and John, which is probably what our first reaction might be to those who are our enemies. Jesus says, you do not know what spirit you are of. I did not come to destroy men's lives. I came to save them. So when he comes into Jerusalem, he weeps. When he's on the cross, he prays. Our attitude should be that of Jesus. We should be grieved over what's taking place in our nation, not just because they're suffering from the virus, but because of the sins and what these sins are going to bring on them. We should be grieved for our children who have left the church. We should be grieved for our brothers and sisters, those that at least profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who have fallen away from the Lord, who are no longer walking with Him as they promised that they would. We should mourn for our nation and for all the nations because of what their sins are bringing on them. We should be affected by these things. That's what affections mean, is to have a heart that is sensitive and moved by these things. We need to have a stronger sensitivity. Secondly, we should let that grief drive us to pray, to pray that the Lord may yet have mercy on those who are affected by these things, which is the vast majority of the world, and to use these things to lead them to repentance and faith. Pray. And then thirdly, we need to make sure we do all that we can to shine the light of God's truth and His love. There's a lot of needs that are, that are coming up uh, during this time. Again, uh, there are those who have and, and perhaps those who have not uh, because of the dynamics that this virus has created. So the Lord would have us to be a witness at this time to those in darkness through acts of charity, by showing the love of Christ, and by sharing His message that they might find Jesus. By the way, let's not forget that our charity does need to begin in, within the house of God. Let's be aware of the needs of our brothers and sisters in the Lord. Keep our ears open if we have the opportunity and the means to be able to help someone in need. Let's certainly try to help them but even those outside of the household of faith. But let's also pray and let's also look for those opportunities to share His truth uh, with, with others. That's why the Lord has brought about these circumstances. Well, let's bow in a moment of uh, silent prayer and then we'll uh, <clears throat> close uh, in prayer.